So please, would you give a big Siouxland welcome to Chef Marcel Villarreal. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being here. Let's give it up to Winnipeg. And honestly, I would also like to give it up to Bruce. Can we get it up for Bruce? That was a good one. And what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm going to strain it through this cheesecloth. And we just want to extract the water of the olive. We're actually going to eliminate any of the fiber. And I have a little, little fine mesh strainer to catch any extra particles that are going to go in there. But I'm just going to go ahead and extract the water. It's kind of like, kind of like milk in a cow. <laughs> it's actually very similar. Very similar. Uh, what happens to all those olives that are inside the? Uh, you really yeah, want to know? Yeah. Do you just throw them away, or what do you do with them? Um, I like to actually dehydrate them and make chips. But uh, oh, chips are they really good? Yeah. I, they're they're actually really good. I also make a uh, this is like an olive gramolata. So um, gramolata is like a traditional topping that you like. When you're making a casserole and you put the breadcrumbs on top of like macaroni and stuff like that, um, I will go ahead and take some of these like olive chips and put that on top with the uh, with the breadcrumbs. Those sound good. It's kind of fun. So I mean, there's there's 100% utilization and everything. So uh, I just weigh this out to the gram, and we have uh, we have exactly 200 grams of olive juice. <laughs> um, so if if you are taking notes, um, is it a cup of cup of cup of? Kappa, kappa, kappa. <laughs> no, which, that's kappa. That's a different. That's a different okay, thing. sorry. Um, so we have rest, right? So we're gonna take this base, and we're just gonna tr drop it gently inside of this bath, right? And you can see it kind of like, see it dropping? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> boom. Um, so um, again. And so what's happening right now is this incredible process where as soon as these two ingredients come into contact with each other, they start to form this jellification. So literally, right now, as we speak, we're doing a controlled jellification. And does she need to hold it all the way in? Or does oh, she just oh, look at this technique. Look, oh, Alex, she's a little nervous. She's a little nervous. Could you okay. just like, dip, dump it in? Yeah, here, take, we'll take the, the bottom of the spoon, like yeah. that. Yeah, and just give it a little tap. Just tap it in. <laughs> you did a great job. Yeah, <laughs> a little tap tap. Couldn't you just dump the thing under and let it go? <laughs> and it's, it's actually, it looks just like it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, one more time, one more time. Now, do it like I would. Just pull it, push it all the way in. Should we have? Pull it all the way in. Yeah, push it in. She is so nervous. Look how beautiful that is. I think we should have Bruce do one. Should we have Bruce? Oh, that's that's for the money with a mountain. Talk to talk, walk to walk. Careful, because they will stick together while they're in there, because they are they are creating. Uh, unless you like them together. Um, <laughs> two jellos at one time. Yep. Yep. Uh huh. Uh huh. Doesn't come out. You got it. You got it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sort of. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's kind of the puny. It's gonna. It's gonna drop. It's gonna drop. <laughs> Look at it. Just little. It just right. So the thing, the thing about this technique. <laughs> so the longer they sit in the bath, that one's perfect. Well, that's, you can't say, you can't even tell which one he did. It's just, the problem is so, the, the bottom's jellifying, but the top's not. Just look at it in there. The oh, there it is. See now, it's good. Well, now it's, it's going to oh, get stuck. No, it's good, it's good, it's good. Well, this is actually a great lesson. We should let them stick together and then. Siamese olives. <laughs> you did a great job. Are you going to do this again? Um, yeah. Oh. Did you do that? <laughs> Not with olives. <laughs> you instead? Um, strawberries? Can you do strawberries? You totally can do strawberries. All right. Let's see. What do they look like then? Or they look like little strawberries? Or they would be red. Strawberries. How would you make them look like strawberries? <laughs> do they look like little olive well, things? Or? They, they would still have that orb shape. But what you can actually do is if you, um, if you had a strawberry mold, you could freeze the base in a strawberry mold and then drop it while it's frozen and it'll actually form the shape. Have you done that one before? I, I have done that Is it one. good? Not strawberries in particular, but we have formed different shapes. Have I seen you do oranges? You have seen me do oranges. Oh, maybe I've seen you do oranges. <laughs> Is he better at oranges or olives? I think oranges taste better. You really don't like the olive, do you? I'm not an olive fan. 
Can you do black olives or just green olives? You totally olives? can do black olives. Excellent. Okay. Can I have olives? All right. Yeah. Have you tried? Have you tried? We're going to add one tablespoon <laughs> of dry vermouth. Notice how that other stuff was like 1.75 liters. This is just eyeball. This one I just, I just do it to the taste. Um, and then actually add about two tablespoons of the brine from the olives. So again, 100% utilization. We actually pureed the olives and then took the liquid out of the olives and we put that into the martini. Um, now, now we reach the question to shake or not to shake. Right? Shake it, not stir, James Bond, we're all familiar with that whole thing, right? And so the thing about it, whether to shake or whether to stir, um, is, is a simple question of how you like your cocktails. Um, a lot of people, with this, with this particular question, when you shake, people say that you should shake it if you have a fruit juice. And if it's a spirit-driven like driven cocktail, if you're basically dealing with all spirits, then you just want to stir it. Um, so this should be a shake stir. It, you want to emulsify all those ingredients, right? And so a lot of people say that you shouldn't shake this cocktail because there's no fruit juice, and you can bruise the gin, right? But I actually, I like to beat it up a little bit. I kind of like, I kind of like the gin bruised. I'm not gonna he lie. He likes the gin rough. I, I like it. I like it a little bit rough. So, um, so I'm gonna shake it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a shake guy, you know. I also know that you dance. I'm a Sean Connery. In it. I got a little Sean Connery. So you dance in the doctor now. You dance in the kitchen too, don't you? Oh yeah, for so sure. This is all in the mood. Uh, and when you want to shake, you don't want to shake too much. But you want to shake it enough. So you shake, shake it vigorously. You don't get like a Polaroid picture. You know, like a salt shaker. But that's like those shake weights. <laughs> do it again. Do it again. One more time. Can you shake yeah, one more time? We all need a photo. Add on some website. Okay, now what are we going to make? What's our next course? All right, so for our next demonstration, we're actually going to make um, kale slaw, which is like my little like version of coleslaw. Um, and kale, believe it or not, is actually in the centerpiece of all of your tables. Um, it's that green leafy vegetable. Uh, that particular variety of kale is different than the one that we're using tonight. Uh, the one that we're using tonight is this one right here which is, uh, has three different names that it goes by. Um, this one is known as Tuscan Kale, Cavalanero, and Black Kale. Um, the one that you have is just green, green leafy. Um, and this one right here is known as the, uh, as the Black Kale. Um, and so the thing about kale is it's reaching, it's, it's, you know, I don't know if you guys hear about it a lot, but it's, it's gain, gaining a lot of popularity in the food world right now as being kind of like a superfood. It's kind, of, it's kind of a powerhouse. Um, it's very healthy for you. Uh, it's got a lot of phytochemicals. It's got a lot of chlorophyll and um, a lot of fiber, actually. Uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, when I first was taught about how to like make a salad and how to properly dress a salad and uh, earmuffs, Bruce, how to properly toss a salad, um, I, you know, I was told to cut it very lightly and actually just put the little drizzle of the dressing and like kind of like fluff the salad and be very light and gentle with it and only dress the salad right before you're about to serve it and just to be very delicate with it. Um, when you're dealing with a kale salad, you can go ahead and throw all those things out the window. All those, all those things right out the window. Um, because kale is a completely different animal. We went all the way on the floor. We're good. Yeah. You know, that's how I roll. So, um, we're going to go We're going to make the kale slop. And these people, they're like, you know, we want everything to be gluten free and dairy free. And I was like, well, how am I going to make a really nice dressing without any, like, Parmesan, without any cream, without any, like, you know, anything that's going to increase the viscosity. And so I started thinking about it, and uh, I came up with the conclusion of um, nut butters, pralines, right? Pralines give you a really, really nice viscosity. Um, and so here we have, I just have a uh, toasted walnuts. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Walnuts, toasted. Um, and so these, these toasted walnuts are just going to go right into the blender. Um, and, but usually, ahead of time, this is something that we do, uh, which is really, really nice. This, this right here is a shallot. It looks like a red onion, but it's a little bit smaller than a red onion. 
Um, and these particular onions have an incredible flavor. Um, I literally use this as the basis for all of my cuisine. Um, whenever I'm starting any sauce, garlic and shallots, I put it and I sweat a little olive oil and then I add all the other ingredients on top of it. But uh, this little product right here is, is, a, is a flavor powerhouse. Um, I'm not going to cook them right now with, with fire, but we are actually going to cook them with acidity. Uh, and so what we do with these shallots is ahead of time, you go ahead and you mince the shallots, right? And so we just go ahead and we take them and we cut them into like small little pieces. Are you able to get the process? He really does a cool thing when he minces that stuff. You go like sideways too. Yeah, so what we do is, if you think about the structure of the, uh, the alien or the uh, the onion is it's uh, they're they're built upon layers, right? And so when you have the onion, typically what we'll go is we'll slice it this way while keeping the root intact. You slice it this way, and then just once or twice that way, and then you go like this. So you basically have like a fan. So I don't know if you can see that, but like it's like a fan. So and then once you go ahead and slice through it, you get all these perfect little pieces. Um, which is a great way to mince onions or, or any particular product. So these shallots, what you want to do is you mince them ahead of time. This, this process takes about five minutes. So you mince the shallots and then vinegar. You just pour vinegar over the shallots. And you let that, what we call, macerate. You let that macerate for about five minutes. Um, and it literally, the acidity inside of the vinegar will actually cook the onions and take out that rawness. I'm very sensitive to raw red onions, or just raw onions in general. If you cut them ahead of time too far, they kind of smell like, for lack of a better term, B.O. And I get some bitter, like raw onion thing, and you smell them, and they're so stinky. Um, but if you take these, these onions, like an onion, and you slice them ahead of time, and you hold them in vinegar, this incredible thing happens, and it takes place. And this is usually the basis for any vinaigrette that we ever make, is, is this process right here. So we're not gonna wait five minutes. I went ahead and, uh, and did that ahead of time. So we have, we have some shallots macerated in vinegar. Um, this particular vinegar, vinegar is, uh, is Banyuls, um, which is a really, really nice product. Uh, it's made out of grapes, and I think I might be partial to it because my last name is Winemaker. But um, it's, uh, it's made from grapes, and it's an incredible thing in this barrel. Is it available locally, or do we have to call you and say, send us a bunch? Call me. Okay. <laughs> um, but you can use any vinegar, red wine, balsamic, champagne, uh, rice wine, cider, whatever you have. It'll work with any, and lemon juice actually works fantastic, which brings me to, that, to my next point, lemon juice. So we're gonna go ahead and add some lemon juice in here. I like to have, when you're, when you're dealing with the kale, you wanna have a lot of acidity. The acidity is going to help you digest this extremely fibrous product, but it's also going to, um, allow the kale to like get broken down. It'll break down the kale for you. So we've got our walnuts, we've got our olive oil, we've got our shallots, we've got our vinegar, and I think, you know what I think we're lacking? We've got acidity, right? We've got uh, walnuts were pretty fatty. We've got salty because I actually salted the nuts after I roasted them. You need sugar. Oh, you know it. You know I need some sugar. 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 You know I need some sugar. And I'm not a big sugar guy, so I like, I like a little honey. So we're just gonna do a little bit of honey to add that sweetness. And when you're when you're developing these recipes or whenever you're cooking, you want to think about taste, right? And there's two big differences. A lot of people don't really understand the difference between taste and flavor. And taste is essentially sweet, sour, bitter, salty. Like those are all tastes. And then flavor usually deals with like the flavor of walnut, the flavor of pomegranate, the flavor of chicken. And so whenever you're cooking your chicken dish, you gotta think about the taste. Like, what do I wanna hit? I wanna have the lemon for the acidity. I wanna have, you know, some sea salt for the salty. I wanna have, you know, a little bit of like honey Dijon for that like bitterness and that sweetness. Um, and so, you know, taste and flavor are, are interesting things and they're totally separate like in half this way. So on the top and the bottom, you have, um, this is like the stem end and then the leaflet end right here, and so we're gonna slice it, like if you look at a lemon, you have the top and the bottom, same thing with pomegranate. Uh, and we're gonna slice it right to the middle. A lot of people do this a lot of different ways, um, but this is probably 
one of the simplest and most easy ways. And you have this incredible, you've, we've released like the heart of the pomegranate. And you can see like the pomegranate juice is all over the place and it, it's ready to get extracted. Um, and so what we're going to do is actually just beat it up and just take the pomegranate and just go and start. And then all the seeds just fall out. They, they actually did. It's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Instead of sitting there and like picking each individual one out of the chambers, you just sit there and just kind of like, bad pomegranate, bad, bad, bad pomegranate. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's, oh, we don't want to know. Um, what a fun. Come here, Chris. Alright. <laughs> 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 um, and that's it. And then you can kind of go ahead and invert it and like pull out any extra seeds. And uh, oftentimes you'll get like you get a couple like a little bit of the fiber inside of there, and you can pick it out. Um, but also a great technique that works is you'll add water, and all of these little like white pieces will just float to the top, and you can skim them off, and then all the seeds sink, and then you have nothing but seeds left, um, which is a, which is a great way to do like size to this size. Um, and they're like, they're yellow, they're pink, they're purple, they're, they're all sorts of different colors. Um, and so for the cooking of the potato, I actually, um, I'm not gonna lie, I just, I just boiled them in water. Um, but when I say I just boiled them in water, uh, I added some aromatics. You know, I put, a, I put a lot of salt in there, about four tablespoons a liter, um, which it seems like a lot of salt, but Believe it or not, potatoes are a very starchy vegetable that they love salt. They can actually take a lot of it. Um, and then I also added bay leaf, garlic, thyme, rosemary, a lot of different ingredients to just kind of really just start infusing that flavor. Start infusing that flavor. Um, and so we've got our potatoes. I like to put peas in my potato mm. salad. I also like to put cucumbers. Uh, a lot of people will use celery, but I don't like to like repeat ingredients with celery and the kale. So we're going, we're going cucumbers. Um, we have some celery leaves, and then some chervil, which is just a green leafy vegetable. And then I actually made uh, mayo. We made our own mayo. Um, and so I thought it'd be interesting to demonstrate mayonnaise, because mayonnaise is an extremely scientific process that a lot of people don't really make their own mayo. Um, and I think it's pretty rad. I, I actually, I love making mayo. Make fun of me. <laughs> it's okay. okay. But I actually really enjoy making mayo. And I thought that, that would be kind of a fun thing to demonstrate. So, the way, we're not just going to make your average mayonnaise, because that would just be too entirely easy. We're going to make, um, we're going to make a flavored mayonnaise. Uh, if I can get this thing off. Don't let me. Uh, we just got this thing the other day, it's called the Ninja. Shamu is entering the building. So, um, we're going to make our own infused oil, and then from the infused oil, we're going to make the mayonnaise. And so, basically for the oil infusion, what we're going to do is take a very neutral oil. Um, this particular oil right here is uh, grapeseed, also known as rapeseed. Um, you can use any particular type of oil. I like this one because it's neutral. There's no flavor, um, and it has a very high smoking temperature, so you can heat it up and not have to worry about uh, ruining any of the volatile compounds inside the oil. Um, it's good for you, and uh, it's, it's a natural product. Um, so those are, those are all like good things there. And so we're going to make an herb oil. And for this particular oil, we've got chives, we've got parsley, and cilantro. Mm. And so we're going to go ahead and put all of those ingredients inside of the blender. And then we're going to go ahead and blend them together with the oil. And then we're going to heat it up. Um, and this process is actually going to allow us to extract all this flavor from the herbs into our oil. And then from that, from that process, or from that infusion, like from that herb oil, essentially what we're gonna do is make our mayonnaise. Even though you could go to the store and just buy a house. Yeah, you could, just, you could do that. But the thing about it is, I'm pretty sure Hellman's doesn't serve 
cilantro, parsley. No, they don't. Shy. I know that. <laughs> Um, and so your basic recipe for um, for making the batter. You're putting that whole thing in there. Whoa! Look at it, really. Don't you're using all of it. It's very no expense here at Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> I took at least twenty dollars from the mess there when I was camping. <laughs> you are a winner. Winner. Chicken dinner. So um, you can actually allow for this process to take place inside the blender because when you're shearing, you're actually creating friction, which heats up the oil. Um, but in order to speed up the process, we're just going to put it in a pot and, and, uh, and cook it. I 
still, I'd still be related to food in some way. He went like this. Um, my sister and I are My favorite brand of knives? Oh, good question. Good question. Um, I like I like Japanese steel. Um, this one right here is a, is a Japanese uh, made knife. But if I had to choose one, it would probably be uh, the Masono, Masono uh, UX10, which is actually Japanese technique with Swedish steel. Um, there's a really, really nice line of knives, but they're extremely expensive. Um, and as a recommendation, I would say Masamoto. Masamoto, uh, they have the highest quality, most economical knives that hold the best edge. Uh, and those are really good. I actually have several Masamotos, and they're not in like the ridiculously expensive line, which, in you know, as a, as a professional chef, like you don't even want to know the exorbitant amount of money that we spend on knives. Um, but we spend a lot of money on them. And so with the Masamoto is that nice, like comfortable area where it's not too much, it's kind of expensive, but they're just really, really high quality. They last a great time, a really long time. And um, there's, a, there's a different thing about knives, which I think is extremely important, um, which, I, which I'll explain to you right now. Um, when you deal with Japanese knives, they're, they're designed like this. Um, and at the base, there's no, it's what we call a bolster. Uh, and with, in German knives, they get thick at the bottom, too. Um, which is, I think, to protect your fingertips or something like that. But the only problem with that particular design is the mere fact that they're impossible to sharpen. Uh, so when you're sharpening a knife, not on the steel, but on the stone, like when you, when you go back and forth like that on the stone, or even if you're a knife sharpener, um, that bolster prevents you from sharpening the knife. Um, so Japanese knives don't have a bolster, so you can actually sharpen them from mm -hmm. the tip to the heel. Um, and if you have a bolster on the heel, this this particular area of your knife right here will never get sharp because there's a gigantic blockade for it.